Blakely, thank you. Um, and thanks you all for joining. Um, and thank you to our two speakers. I'm looking forward to, to the talks and the data they'll present. So our first speaker is Dr. Kushbu Boris Slater, who is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Surrey. Um, Kushbu graduated from the Insti Indian Institute of Technology in India um, with a degree in biotechnology, and she then did her DPhil in the University of Oxford. She's been at Surrey since 2016, and her current work is focused on host pathogen metabolic interactions and the, look, the identification of metabolic drug targets, both for Mycobacterium tuberculosis and Mycobacterium leprae. Kushbu, over to you. Do you want to share your brilliant, fantastic? And then do you want to make it full screen? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Helen. Uh, thank you, Blakely. Um, thank you both for organizing this and giving, this, giving me this opportunity today to share uh, some of my research, but in general more to spark or to uh, bring in people to conversation or remind ourselves about leprosy, which has become more like a forgotten disease um, and it's been haunting um, or has been amongst humans for over a century. So in this seminar or in my presentation, I will take you through um, the introduction about the disease, about uh, what we know so far and end the presentation with a bit of my own research on the host pathogen interaction that I am looking at in leprosy. So I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of um, Surrey. I work on uh, tuberculosis as well and leprosy and tuberculosis, uh, they both are caused by mycobacterial pathogens and hence my interest in um, leprosy as, as well as tuberculosis. Uh, from, and this comes from my previous experience in research and uh, my uh, interest. So leprosy, it's an ancient chronic infectious disease. It was discovered more than 100 years ago by the Norwegian scientist, um, Gerard Hansen, hence leprosy has also been known as Hansen's disease. It still remains a major problem in mostly in the developing nations, causing over 200,000 infections a year. And the key of the recurring infections or new infections in these developing nations is because of the resource limited inadequate uh, living conditions and disadvantages, um, disadvantages people uh, in the society. Mycobacterium leprae, which is related to the tuberculosis pathogen, Mycobacterium tuberculosis, is the bacterial cause or the pathogenic cause of this infection. In 2019, World Health Organization recorded about 202,000 new cases. This is a map showing you geographical distribution of the newly detected cases, where India accounts for over 50% of the cases. And recently, there has been uh, reports of new infections, relapse infections, which is um, increasing in many parts of India. There are gender and age-related distributions of leprosy cases. One of the studies here uh, by Junior et al. 2020, uh, published in 2021, last year, uh, the authors looked at distribution of cases and uh, was if there, there were gender and age-related um, distributions in Brazil between 2008 and 2018. And this, in this period of 10 years of um, cases, uh, detected cases, the authors um, found, stated that uh, male population is in, affected more 
by this infection. Amongst the age-related distributions, there were uh, the children were found to be less infected, less affected by this disease, whereas adults uh, in 50, between 15 and 59 uh, years of age, uh, the disease um, accounted for more than 80, 85, more than 85 percent. Another study, which was independently conducted in China between 2000 and 2015, showed that there's also uh, a gender bias or a gender related distribution where more than 70% of uh, cases were male um, and the rest or the smaller proportion were female. This is a general overview of how of leprosy transmissions and the roots and infection and symptoms. I will go into more details in the uh, following slides about uh, symptoms and cl disease classifications. Here we see the cause of the agent Mycobacterium leprae infecting a leprosy patient who has characterized skin lesions and nodules which can appear in any part of the skin. And an infected individual then transmits or then infects other people in the community by uh, infected aerosols or coughing. Um, the transmission route is not just aerosol, actually. In case of leprosy, it's more through close contact as well, living in the same household, uh, for example, caring for a patient, or in a household, uh, it's from. Um, parents to children transmission as well. Multiple, there are multiple risk factors. Poverty is one of the biggest one in leprosy. And with poverty, there, is, there comes the uh, unhygienic or inadequate living conditions like contaminated water, insufficient diet, uh, and um, improper environmental conditions. The symptoms of this disease are skin lesions, nodules, patches, uh, and nerve damage. In severe cases of leprosy, it's also physical deformity, disfigurement, paralysis, and in some cases, it's also blindness. A, um, a very nice study showed uh, or hypothesized some of the uh, pathways between various uh, animal and environmental reservoirs, which contribute to the transmission of this disease, uh, where, where we have human to human transmission, like I briefly um, talked to you about. Uh, and then there is transmission from animals to humans, one of the main ones being armadillos, which carry, uh, which are a known uh, important or um, a famous or popular carrier of Mycobacterium leprae, the pathogen. There is the environmental conditions, and there are another um, so resor resources or transmission modes, which is the bio insects and amoeba. One of my collaborators um, in Brazil uh, who work with uh, leprosy, they have been using uh, ticks as a model to develop uh, uh, efficient ex vivo model um, for leprosy research, and hence. Um, we know that from our own close research work that ticks are also, can also be carriers. Um, the disease classification in leprosy was uh, primarily done by a World Health Organization according to the visible symptoms. It was primarily two types, posse bacillary, with one to five, five skin patches, or visible bacteria, and multibacillary, which is more than five skin patches and, in, and visible bacteria in the skin smears. Then comes, uh, and then uh, after WHO's primary uh, or the binary classification, um, a number of authors argued that uh, having binary classification according to the number of patches of bacteria is not an efficient way or is not the best way to classify the disease. So it was then uh, leprosy is now well classified based on the clinical manifestations of the infection in terms of lesions, 
skin patches, nerve damage, and disfigurement of the face and limbs. We have the tuberculoid, borderline tuberculoid, borderline borderline, borderline lepromatous, lepromatous leprosy. The last one here is the most severe form of the disease, which not only causes nerve damage, but also causes physical dis disfigurement and um, leads, leads to uh, blindness and permanent damage. Disease is uh, also classified based on the leprosy reactions. Now, leprosy reactions are um, those which you can say these are the immune responses uh, which the host um, produces or um, shows against the pathogen M. leprae or when infected by M. leprae. Reactions are primarily three types, type one reversal, which is characterized by different clinical uh, forms of the disease and are mainly driven by cell mediated uh, responses where you, can, where you can see the inflammation maybe, or the responses or the reactions may be centered or focused in one region of the body. For example, here it's the hand, which is uh, showing you the type one reactions. Of course, this causes nerve damage there is, um, and it's characterized by lesions. Type two or ENL is, um, it's, again, it causes, uh, it affects nerves, eyes, lymph nodes, skin inflammation, and painful nodules. But in ENL, you could actually see a, a more um, uniform distribution of nodules uh, in a patient here. We then have another form, which is uh, called pretty leprosy, where the skin nodules are not as uh, prominent or as um, severe as type one and type two, but you can see they're it's called pretty leprosy because these are mainly soft wrinkles and irregular lesions across uh, the infected individual's body. There are many tests uh, for several tests for diagnosing uh, for diagnosis of leprosy. And diagnosis is really key for leprosy, uh, for preventing and for treatment. This is because Leprosy can take ages to incubate and develop. There are multiple tests. I've listed only a few here. The famous uh, or the popular lepromin skin antigen test, which where you inject, where the in individual is injected with um, M. leprae antigens, and if the uh, individual shows uh, immune responses, then it's characterized as being or confirmed as being a case of leprosy. We have smear tests and biopsies, uh, where, uh, exa or where whether a skin lesion or a tissue lesion consists of the M. leprae bacilli or not is confirmed by microscopy examination, uh, staining such as the acid, fast, eel, nails and staining. There are serological tests and also a number of PCR tests. There are many challenges ahead in diagnosis of leprosy. A sensitivity, B specificity, then there comes the early detection and the cases of relapse and drug resistance. Uh, the sensitivity and specificity of most of these tests is ranging between um, 50 to 80. So there is really uh, a need and push for um, studying this disease and finding alternative or better techniques. The other major problem is having no specific vaccine against leprosy. BCG is the vaccine which is used. Um, BCG is the tuberculosis vaccine, which is also being administered for leprosy. But it's got the problem of low protection or um, it's, it's, it's varied across different populations. Uh, for example, in Myanmar, this vaccine only showed 20% efficacy in the population, whereas in Uganda, it was above 80. Timely diagnosis and multi-drug treatment is the key for treating this disease. We have the first line antibiotics, stapsin, plefizamine, and rifampicin, to treat the disease, and second line antibiotics to treat cases of 
uh, drug resistance and relapse. Now, leprosy reactions are can um, are severe in some cases, so there are steroids for treating these reactions and calming down uh, the responses or to manage the responses in infected individual. There are multiple challenges in the treatment as well. It's the patient compliance because the treatment causes enormous side effects, awareness amongst the infected people and also the society to be able to recognize the disease and put efforts towards fighting this. And there is stigma and discrimination, which I will talk to you in details in the next slide. So, like we said, the challenges and the future and, and the work that needs to be done in the future are to focus on diagnostics, disease management, new therapies to treat the drug, drug resistant and reactions in patients, better health programs, education, opportunities for affected communities, and COVID-19 hasn't helped like it hasn't helped in many diseases. It has negatively impacted the progress in treating leprosy across the world. The future research needs to be focusing on vaccines, animal models, and our ability to grow the pathogen in the, in the lab. Mother Teresa said that stigma and discrimination are the biggest problems in diseases like leprosy and tuberculosis. We have to fight against the stigma against deformity. Here is a woman with leprosy. Now, the biggest discrimination with women in this community is that if it's a young woman, it's the uh, problem with them getting married, setting up a family, and also be, being, uh, being, them being able to work, not as because of the, um, of the norms in society where women should not be with leprosy because it causes physical deformity. Then we have the unhygienic conditions where population is segregated from the society, poverty, due to poverty and inequalities. So this is the general overview of leprosy that I wanted to talk to you or share with you that can um, lead us to some conversations. And if I can have two more minutes just to take you through what I do um, in understanding the horse pathogen interaction of this disease. So my work focuses on Mycobacterium leprae, which is the pathogen, and I am interested in finding out what is the biology of this pathogen, which is so less well studied. This is a picture showing you what the bacteria looks like in skin staining, the red ones of the bacteria. What I do is to ask a simple question, can M. leprae use glucose as a nutrient source? So I use glucose, which is isotopically labeled, have Schwann cells, which is the primary infection, infected cells, or primary sites of infection for leprae, infect the cells, give isotopically labeled glucose to track down the metabolism of the cells and bacteria. And using metabolomic analysis, what we found was that M. leprae uses glucose differently to TB. The blue here is uh, leprae and the red here is TB. So just focusing on this phenylalanine metabolite, you can see that TB and leprosy are different. And one of the findings that we that I, that I worked or found was that leprae uses glucose metabolism and the anapleuritic node, which is one of the primary nodes in um, carbon metabolism, very differently to the TB bacteria. I am just quickly taking you through. We also work on in vivo metabolism. Whereas just we want to understand if leprae infects the nude mice, what are or what is the biology of the pathogen like? So we use experimental model of mice and M. leprae infection, and then in silico model of genome scale metabolic model construction, use the in silico and the experimental approaches, and 
what we found was that leprae uses a number of active pathways, which are central carbon metabolism, cofactor, amino acids, cell wall synthesis when it's infecting the host. We are also currently working to tackle the problem of the failure to cultivate this bacteria in the laboratory. And hence, uh, using our previous study, we come, came up with a recipe, which we are now testing to see if we can, uh, if we are able to grow leprae in the lab. I know in the interest of time, I am rushing um, through the presentation, but I'm very happy to talk and uh, discuss further in questions that uh, to follow, if there are any. So I would like to thank a lot of people, and here are a few on the slides, uh, from Surrey, from Germany, from Brazil, from India and the USA, without whom the research that I have been doing in leprosy would not be possible. I thank you for your attention and happy to have any questions. Trishri, thank you. That was super. A uh, really lovely overview of leprosy, I think reminding us all of what a devastating pathogen this is. Um, and I think, you know, I particularly like the way you really illustrated the human cost of this very ancient pathogen. Um, so, so lots of interesting thoughts there. Um, and uh, I just so please put up your hand or um, wave at me um, if, if you've got questions. Um, maybe I'll kick off to start with. So to just say, I was really interested. I mean, one of the challenges, as you highlighted, with working on leprosy is an inability to culture it and an inability, apart from in the armadillo, to have an animal model. So you mentioned the tick model, and I'm just curious to know a little bit more about that. Yeah, so... Um... The stick model, uh, it's been published as well. This is from one of my collaborators who is leading the work, uh, work in Brazil. They're based at Ferro Cruz and they have shown that leprosy, the bacteria, is able to replicate and survive in tick models. Okay. I am aware that there needs to be more work done in order to validate this model. But if we are able to have an inexpensive and easy to um, develop or uh, apply ex vivo model that, that will be really useful for research. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Good. Well, I look forward to seeing how that develops. I think any model is better than no model at the moment. Yeah. Um, Shil Shil Shilpa. Yeah. Hello. Hi. Hello. Go ahead. Yeah. Hi. yeah I'm, I'm, am I audible to you all? Yes, perfectly so. Yeah. I have to have a question to her. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was very good presentation. Uh, we got many knowledges about the metabolism. So actually I work on the leprosy samples, like on patient samples. So I'm looking for the metabolism profile of the patients with leprosy. So like, do you have any idea like what kind of metabolism switch, like when the patients are in leprosy night stage? So in the disease state, what is the, uh, what are the cell metabolism, like lymphocyte metabolism of the patients? So do you have an idea like, uh, can you provide some idea? Like you said that they use glucoses. So can you just suggest something uh, like what are the lymphocyte metabolism of the cells in these patients mm -hmm. of leprosy? Mm -hmm. So I can, I am not a cell biologist here, but I can speak, speak from the previous publications and also the work yeah. of my collaborators who are cell-based uh, scientists. So what happens in the lymphocytes or white blood cells is that, uh, yeah. Upon leprae infection, you get a huge burst of lipid droplets. So okay. lipids, I would say, is will is one of the big markers of the cells. Okay. Also, in Sean cells that we use as an okay. ex vivo model to study um, the pathogen biology and host pathogen mm -hmm. interaction, uh, mm -hmm. we also see uh, lipid droplets, cholesterol metabolism uh, being upregulated in infected host cells okay okay thanks thanks a lot thanks a lot very very good let me move on to bill uh bill jacobs you have a question yeah a lovely talk um <clears throat> and i appreciate the difficulties have you tried um you know in a study in in india where they 
did the massive BCG immunization. They saw 50% protection against leprosy. And I wondered if you've ever been, if, if you've tried repeating that in an animal model. Uh, I mean, no. Would you... uh, so I don't work with vaccines. Uh... Uh, and I would not be the best person to answer your question. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> uh, no, no, no worries. No worries. It's, a good, it's a good question. It would be a nice, a nice thing to do. So a few questions in the chat. So we've got a couple of minutes left before we move on to the next one. So Kushbu, I'll just read out a couple of questions in the lab. Any progress in growing MTB, uh, sorry, M. leprae, Freudian slip there, in the lab? Oh, this is uh, this has been key for a couple of years uh, for us now, and we have the base media, and we are um, constantly optimizing. And there is some good news. So, in the future, I am optimistic that we'll be able to give you uh, a list of ingredients, and more like the media to be able to cultivate leprae in the lab. But this will be a revolution in the in terms of bacterial. Uh, research on leprosy, but you, you, we have to wait a bit this, because we are validating this. Okay, well, that will be a major advance in the field <laughs> if you can achieve that. So, um, look forward to, to hearing about that. Um, okay, so, uh, question here about role of siderophores um, in making M. leprae grow on artificial media because we know leprae lacks siderophore synthesis and an iron acquisition mm -hmm. system. Yes, very good question. We do have ions um, in the media and because this work is ongoing and optimization, it's not just siderophores. I can tell you that there are a few other metals, amino acids and also small molecule metabolites, which are um, intermediates in glycolysis actually, uh, and nucleotides, which, which are showing a positive impact on the growth of leprae. Interesting, very interesting. All right, last question. Um, is there evidence that people with latent TB infection have lower have a lower incidence of leprosy? Thinking about cross-reactivity of immune mm. agents. I will I will admit that I am not the expert in latent TB or um, the disease relapse in case of leprosy. But this is a good question to end and think about it. So uh, Thank you um, for yeah. bringing this up. Yeah, it's a very valid question. Isn't it is it? thinking about the interaction between these yes. pathogens. So super. Well, look, Kushbi, thank you. That really was a lovely talk and really clearly delivered. Uh, and thank you very much. Um, so now let me hand over. I'm delighted to welcome our second speaker. So um, Dr. Chintia Carolina Diaz, um, who is a researcher in Paraguay, and apologies, I'm not going to even try and pronounce your institute. Um, uh, Chin Chintia graduated from the uh, National University of uh, Asuncion, um, and then had a PhD from Fiocruz in, in Brazil. And Cintia's main interest is in um, the me pathogenesis mechanisms of mycobacterium leprae. So, uh, uh, Cintia, thank you and welcome. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Shane, and thank you, everybody, for this opportunity. I will be talking a little bit fast because of time, so sorry about that. Um, let me share the, the presentation. So let's skip this introduction. We have two ongoing collaborative projects with few crews. One is uh, mainly uh, focused on pathogenesis and the other one is on uh, the search of biomarkers. Uh, let's focus first on the, on the first part. Uh, we will talk about the role of glycolipid PGL1 in the interaction of mycobacterium leper with Schwann cells. Uh, this work has, uh, the results have been partially uh, published, so we will talk about that. Uh, uh, our colleague has already talked about epidemiology, so I can skip this part, which is good for time. So let's go into uh, genomic data. Uh, we know that uh, M. leprae has, has lost so many genes compared to M. tuberculosis and has a lot of uh, pseudogenes in its genome. So uh, it is very um, 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 dependent on host machinery for its survival, but it has retained uh, several genes associated to uh, the synthesis of the 
cell membrane. Uh, so we know that for an leopard, this uh, pathway is very important. So we focused on that. A uh, little bit of background information about the cell wall. It's, it, it's a complex cell wall as, as, our, uh, as mycobacterial cell walls are. We have the, the, membrane, the cell membrane, an interlayer with arabinum galactan and peptidoglycans. We have many lipids here, uh, mycolic uh, acid. And we have an external layer where we have to focus on this, uh, these compounds for you to remember the liparabinomana and the phenolic glycolipids. The phenolic glycolipids are, uh, have a common lipid portion in different mycobacteria. We have the mycocerosates and the thiocerol, which is a common lipid portion that is uh, linked to a phenol. Uh, uh, ring and that is uh, uh, linked to a uh, carbohydrate moiety. In PGL1, which is uh, exclusive of M. leprid, and it's an important virulence factor, in fact it's three percent of, uh, of its weight, uh, we have uh, uh, three sugars and the external one is uh, glucose. In PGLTB, which is uh, uh, synthesized in some strains of uh, mycobacteria, especially in the Beijing family, we have also three sugars, but with an external fructose. And in Mycobacterium bovis, we only have one laminose. So the sugar part is what distinguishes uh, the, those phenolic glycolite lipids. Sorry. So uh, I wanted to talk about a little bit about the role of PGL1 that has already been published by the group of uh, Lambucana in adhesion and internalization. For that, I want to explain a little bit about the uh, structure of the uh, Schwann cell that surrounds the axon. So this is and and this is a myelin sheet that insulates the action and allows nerve impulse to be transmitted. So neuron has Schwann cells surrounding it, and according to uh, NG and Rambukana and collaborators, they propose that PGL1 interacts with alpha two laminin from the basal lamina that surrounds the Schwann cell and ditch proglycan and uh, through this pathway, PGL1 is able to be internalized into the Schwann cell. They also talk about the contact dependent demyelination of the nerve that we all, all know that occurs in leprosy. So, when you have a co culture of a neuron with uh, Schwann cells, you can see the production of myelin, which is marked in red here. When you put it in contact with dead M. lepre or PGL1 per se, uh, you can see a demyelination, sorry, and you have uh, myelin debris in this picture. So considering this important role of PGL1 in as a virulence factor for uh, M. lepre, uh, we wanted to investigate the role of PGL1 as a virulence factor in the interaction with M. lepre of M. lepre with the Schwann cell. For this, we used uh, recombinant BCG strains that were produced in, in, uh, in the University of Toulouse by Christophe Guillot. These recombinant strains, they uh, produce uh, PGL1 instead of PGL bovis and PGL TB instead of PGL bovis. So we used these strains to confirm the participation of PGL1 in the attachment and internalization of M. lepre to Schwann cells from the ST8814 lineage and in primary new Schwann cells. We also analyzed the influence of the viability of mycobacteria on the evasion and phenotypic modulation of Schwann cells. So we use an in vitro model and our main stimuli were bacteria, mycobacteria, the recombinant strains and bits covered with di distinct different uh, antigens. And the main uh, methods we used were cytometry and my, uh, fluorescence microscopy. So as a first step, we wanted to, uh, um, to see the critical role of PGO1 in internalization of mycobacteria. As you can see, 
the only BCGPG1 is able to be internalized or associated with strong cell through uh, disorder through flow cytometry. And you, you can see that there is a time dependent association. After 48 hours of incubation, 80% of strong cells have BCGPG1 associated. We also did a quenching of the external uh, fluorescence of this bacteria using triton blue to see how uh, if these cells are only uh, attached to the cell or internalized. And after 48 hours, you can see that most bacilli are within uh, the cell. And also did an assay with, uh, at four degrees to inhibit the internalization and only see adhesion. And we see that the bacterium that expresses PGL1 uh, has more adhesion than the other recombinant strains. We also made use of uh, the recombinant strains that express TFP, and we could see by flow cytometry, by my, uh, fluorescence microscopy, that these bacilli are more attached to Schwann cells than the other two recombinant strains. So, uh, Next, we wanted to see if there is an, since, since internalization can be an active process, we wanted to see if the if uh, dead bacilli were able to be internalized also. So we killed the bacteria with gamma irradiation, and we saw that uh, uh, the percentage of cells with internalized bacteria decreased when uh, dead bacteria were used. And also we looked at the MFI and we saw that less uh, dead bacilli per cell were present in short cell compared to live ones. We also looked at different moist or multiplicity of infections or proportions. And we saw that at the proportion of 100 to, to one, uh, almost all Schwann cells had associated bacilli. And then when we use, when we look at the MFI, uh, we, but we can still see that the bacilli, uh, there are less dead bacilli per cell than uh, live bacilli. We obtained this, uh, this M. lepre from uh, um, type 53 strain from a timic bulk C mouse food pass. Uh, we also checked this, this uh, results in by fluorescence microscopy, and you can see that BCGPG1 and M. lepre uh, has a similar level of association to Schwann cells, and that dead uh, bacilli are less uh, associated. And finally, we checked this result also in primary human Schwann cells, and the same phenomenon was observed, and we also used beads. Latex beads covered with PGL1, and we, we observed that PGL1 uh, helped in the internalization of these green fluorescent beads. So, our next question was Is the carbohydrate portion of PGL1 essential for the internalization? So, we used a synthetic um, compound called NDO BSA that has only the two extreme sugars from the molecule and attached to albumin and then attached to the lattic beads. And we compared the degree of internalization and association. And we observed that uh, the presence of the sugars helped the internalizations of these uh, lattic beads. So let, uh, some uh, partial conclusions is that PDL1 mediates adhesion and the internalization into Schwann cells corroborating the data from the literature. The glycidic portion of PGL1 participates in the interaction with Schwann cells, and PGL1 is necessary for internalization, but it is not enough. Uh, the internalization also depends on bacterial viability. So, our data show that live bacteria are most efficient at infecting Schwann cells. Uh, could it be that live bac uh, bacteria induces a phenotypic alteration of the host cell, leading to expression of phagocytic receptors? in favoring the entry of new bacteria. To answer this question, we did this uh, uh, experimental approach in which we stimulated, cell, uh, stimulated cells uh, in a low moi, 10 to 1, with no fluorescence, uh, with live M. lepre or BCGPGO1. 
And in the second stimulus, we put uh, at the MOYO 51, a what type BCG that was fluorescently labeled, and we left that for 48 hours of incubation. So what we can see is that the pre-infection with BCGPDR1 or MLEPRE uh, allows now the internalization of wild type BCG, either alive or dead, which previously wasn't possible. And then if you check with other pre-stimulus like beets or beets covered with PGL1 or dead bacilli, we don't see the same phenomenon. So was this only for wild type BCG? Uh, with, with, with us did on another experiment where we the second stimulus was Mycobacterium smegmatis, and we could see that nothing happened in the degree of uh, cells uh, with associated bacteria. And we did some other additional uh, experiments like putting PGL1 in, in the culture medium, and we did not see any effect on. This is dual type internalization or in bits internalization. And also we did uh, the pre-stimulus with life and death and lepre and BCGPGL1 and no effect was seen on internalization of green fluorescent bits. So what we can see is, uh, sorry, that pre-infection with M. lepre or BCG pga one allows internalization of wild type BCG in Schwann cells. And this phenomenon is dependent on the viability of the bacillus. If you pre-treat cells uh, with bits coated with pga one this does not happen. Also, if you add pga one to the culture, that uh, doesn't happen either. If you pre-infect cells with BCG pga one or M. lepre, there is no increased internalization of latex beads nor uh, smegmatis, showing that this is a selective allocytic process. So our results suggest that the entry of life M lepre or BCG modulates the Schwann cell uh, phenotype in such a way that it begins to express new phagocytic receptors with other specificities, enabling a, a, in a, a second phase of entry of a line through uh, alternative pathways. So which receptor might be involved in this second wave of entry? We uh, compared anti-smegmatic cell wall with, uh, uh, with M-tuberculosis cell wall. And we saw that uh, manose capping in, in tuberculosis, which we saw that uh, uh, capping in tuber tuberculosis was different to smegmatis. One has manose and the other one has phosphoinositol. So we, we proposed uh, one of these three candidates as a receptor that's been uh, uh, modulated. CD206 is the MANOS receptor. So to confirm this hypothesis, we treated ourselves with the culture medium with MANOS in increasing concentration. And when you uh, uh, add MANOS, uh, the, the level of internalization of what type BCG in the second uh, phase of infection uh, decreases. We also looked if uh, it, uh, the of the pre-infection with live I mean, leper or BCG one allows uh, a better um, internalization of lung lung covered green beads, and um, that was that was the case. So. We, we, we looked at the MANOS receptor at the transcriptional level. We saw an upregulation after four hours of, of uh, infection. It also, we saw also an upregulation for wild type BCG, but this uh, decreased in 24 hours and the other one was higher and more sustained. And we also looked at this uh, regulation at the uh, proteic level with uh, flow cytometry, and you can see that CD206 is upregulated after infection with M. lepre or BCG PGL1. And the same was observed uh, by using uh, flow uh, fluorescence microscopy. So, this is only to look at the uh, competition assay. When you do the co infection, while the BCG is associated to Schwann cells. But when you add manos, uh, less bacteria are associated. The next step was to uh, do a knockdown of the manos receptor. The gene for it is an 
MRC1. And what we uh, first saw is the knockdown of this receptor. So the knockdown was successful with this siRNA. And in the second phase, we looked at the effect of the internalization of wild IBCG after uh, the knockdown of CD206. And we, uh, we saw a decrease. Also for M. lepre, there was a decrease in internalization, but of course it still enters because it has other pathways. And the same was uh, besides flow cytometry, we saw the same phenomenon uh, by fluorescence microscopy. So previous reports have shown that uh, uh, CD206 uh, or the MANOS receptor is capable of interacting with uh, the which is transcription factor called PP, PPR gamma, which uh, is a transcription factor, peroxisome proliferated activated receptor gamma. It is a master transcription factor regulating multiple cellular functions like lipid metabolism and foam cell generation that we all know is very important for uh, tuberculosis and leprosy. The induction and activation of PPR gamma by pathogenic mycobacteria in macrophages has been linked to their capacity to persist in these cells and also uh, has been linked to uh, lipid droplet biogenesis. So since LMM leprin has been shown to induce lipid droplet formation, we now analyze the potential involvement of PPR gamma in inducing the MANOS receptor in M. leprin BCG one infected strong cells and the involvement of this MANOS receptor and PPR gamma in LD formation. So first we looked at bi-western blotting at the production of PPR gamma after infection with BCG pgl one or M. lepre. And you can see an, uh, uh, an increase in production compared to what a BCG or a not infected condition. And when we treat uh, the cells with a non-reversible non inhibitor of uh, PPR gamma, we can see a reduction in the, pro in, in the production of the MANOS receptor. This is by close cytometry. And we saw the same phenomenon with uh, uh, fluorescent microscopy. So we, we, mark, we labeled the cells with, for CD206 in green. We treated the cells with the inhibitor of PPR gamma. And you can see a reduction in the expression of this receptor, which was uh, uh, quantified here. And uh, we also uh, looked at the effect of this, this inhibitor of PPR gamma on the internalization of uh, beads covered with lung. And we can see a decrease once the cells are treated with um, this drug in the presence of BCGPG01 or M leopard. Then uh, we looked at the effect of, uh, of uh, regulating the MANUS receptor on the PPR gamma transcriptor factor. As you can see, when cells are infected with uh, PCGPG01, uh, you have here uh, uh, PPR gamma labeling. And, and when you treat uh, cells with MANOS, there is an, an, a decrease in the, in the labeling of PPR gamma. This was uh, quantified. And you can see that BCGPG01 uh, infection induces uh, 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 increases abundance in PR gamma, uh, especially in the nucleus. And when you add mammals, this decreases. The next question was uh, the effect of the inhibitor or of uh, PPR gamma on the lipid metabolism, since we all know that we know that PPR gamma. Uh, is responsible for lipid uh, uh, metabolism regulation. So what we did was we marked here and leprin in green. Uh, we infected the Schwann cells. We marked uh, lipid droplets with all red O is specific for that. And when we treat cells with, uh, with the inhibitor of PPR gamma, we can see a reduction in lipid droplet formation. So, uh, the same was done uh, for cells infected with M. leprin and BCGPG01, but instead of the G GW inhibitor, we use MANOS, and we can also see a reduction in uh, lipid droplet formation. 
From previous studies, we knew that uh, the formation of lipid droplets in M. leper infection were associated with the production of prostaglandin E2, important in immunomodulation. So we looked at the effect of the treatment with, with GW on this production and with the reduction. We also uh, looked at the effect of manuals and also see a reduction. And finally, looked at the viability of this bacilli through PCR, PCR, and we see that manuals can have a little impact of about 30% on viability of the bacilli. Finally, we know that there is a link between uh, PPR gamma and the production of uh, interleukin leukin 8. So we we um, we did a knockdown of the uh, Manox receptor and looked at the production of IL-8 in BCGPG1 infected Schwann cells, and we see a reduction. The same happened for M. leper infected Schwann cells, and and in, instead of the knockdown, we also say same question with uh, addition of Manox. We can also see a reduction in the production of IL-8. And finally, uh, we essayed the same question with uh, the treatment of the, with the irreversible inhibitor, and we saw the same result. And finally, we can see this, uh, this hypothesis in a nerve lesions of leprosy patients where we can, we selected nerve lesions of, uh, of uh, leprosy patients and nerve lesions of non-leprosy patients, and we can see the expression of the receptor in Schwann cells, and also the co-localization of these receptors in Schwann cells with uh, bacilli. So I'm going to skip this, but we have thus a model uh, to try to explain all these phenomena, but I think uh, due to time, I'm going to just go on, just to tell you, uh, rapidly that we are continuing with essays surrounding its, the importance of PGO1, uh, doing uh, interactomics and proteomics, transatomics. And the second uh, part of this uh, talk was very shortly about what we are doing now here in Paraguay with Brazil, that is the search of biomarkers uh, in blood of patients and contacts. For that, we take whole blood samples to antigen stimulation and look for biomarkers by luminescence. Yeah, we and have to probably need to wrap up. Cells for maybe T cell phenotyping. Chintia, Chintia, we signatures. We, we, I'm keen to leave time for questions. It's very fast. I'm keen to leave time for questions. Okay, so maybe if you can, um, uh, thank you. That was a. A huge amount of, of work. And I can't. I can't hear you. Can you not hear me? Can anyone hear me? I can hear you, Helen. Okay. And I so, could hear Cynthia perfectly well. So, so Cynthia, that was a super presentation. If you can stop sharing, um, uh, I think it's important we leave time for questions. Um, but a uh, huge amount of work and some really elegant experiments there, actually. Uh, a really lovely sort of story that you told. Uh, so Sorry, I, I can't hear you. Uh, I'm not sure why you can't hear me. I think everyone else can hear me. I'm, I'm saying what a super talk that was. Can I ask people to put up their hands if they have any questions? Um, and maybe I'll start while I, I think um, really interesting the story about the interaction between the CD206 uh, and uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, can so you hear me, I Cynthia? Can, can you hear me, Cynthia? Sorry, I, I, I can you know. Can both of you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> can you hear me, Cynthia? Oh, if you are asking a question. Oh no. So <laughs> I don't I don't think Cynthia is going to be able to hear any questions actually. If anyone has a question, maybe can I ask you to put it in the chat? Um uh and let's see. I mean that was a super presentation. Um so let me just type a message in the chat. Um super presentation. Um So there's a general question here. Thanks, Carlos. 
there's a, a lab that has an animal model underway to test is so is that a is there a lab that has animal models that we can test vaccines against dem leprae okay i can see the question in the chat from dr carlos martin there is a laboratory that has an animal model to test vaccines i don't know there is specific specifically to test vaccines. I know in Brazil they they work with the animal models, uh, specifically in Sao Paulo, Baru Institute, where where they send us the uh, where they have the mouse model for infection. But I don't know if elsewhere there is something for vaccines. How MTB supports the host immunotrons? How will you work on developing a drug target based on CD and PR down? So uh, we were we were all thinking about maybe uh, targeting the uh, the lipid metabolism. We have to look at uh, we were thinking about. Um, nanoparticles covered with manos and capture the drug in it and maybe do uh, target delivery of the drug. Okay, interesting. Can, can you hear me now? No. But uh, we still, we are not at that stage yet, but we have talked about it because it would be an interesting uh, step. In interesting. Interesting. It's, it's very um, weird why I can't hear you. So sad. So sad. Yes, we do. <laughs> we would be interesting. Okay. I don't know why Cynthia can't hear us anymore, but I, I think we probably should draw this to a close then. Um, but thank you to both our speakers. I believe you did save me, help me. I can't hear anybody. <laughs> thank, thank you for both our speakers. And um, uh, thank you all for listening. Blakely, do you want to close? <laughs>